Quite probably most of you by now are aware of the ivory billed woodpecker. That big bird with the pointed head that for the last 70 years has been considered to be extinct. Recently, the bird was discovered in the Cache River Bottoms. It does exist. It's not extinct. And uh, there are some who think that it's going to bring a boon to the Delta with tourism. I hope that materializes. I've heard that there are more dedicated bird watchers in the United States than there are people dedicated to hunting and fishing or even to playing golf. In our neck of the woods, that seems difficult to believe, but maybe it's true that people from all over the country will come here to see that bird. I hope it does happen. The bird is not extinct. There's another thing that is not extinct that I learned just recently that has served somewhat for the, as a suggestion for this lesson. I'm going to show you, and you can't see it because it's too far away. But this is a copy of an editorial of the cartoon that appeared in the Jonesboro Sun on May the 26th. I'll describe it to you because you can't see it because down here there are a couple of big game hunters. They have on their hard hats. They have a hunting map which says judicial nominee process. And the caption that was given this editorial cartoon is, U.S. Senators discover a creature previously thought to be extinct. So the artist drew that creature and called it compromise. It has the body of an elephant, the head and tail of a donkey. So this is compromise. This is a getting together. This is leaving two extremes and being willing to come together in the middle for progress. This dealt primarily with, as you recall, not too long ago, the problem of voting on judges for a judicial system in the federal courts. There were those who were threatening to filibuster because there were some judges that were been, had been proposed and they didn't want them, so they were going to filibuster and not let it come to vote. I don't know just where the word filibuster came into being, but my guess is that it came from the fact that those people said, I'm going to talk and talk and talk and talk, and you're full of it, Buster. So they called it filibuster. <laughs> but at any rate, that's what they were going to do so that it would never come to a vote. There were some Republicans and senators got together. They thought, we'll never get anywhere this way. They said, we will vote. We'll vote on at least five of those. And uh, any others that come up, we're going to maintain our right to filibuster. Now, then the resignation of Judge O'Connor and maybe the uh, required resignation soon or replacement of our Chief Justice. There's going to be a necessity for compromise. That's where people will disregard deep-seated prejudices and come together on the basis of certain facts in order that progress might be made. In the church, and that's what we want to consider today, there are many areas in which compromise can be done, but there are many areas in which we cannot compromise. We want to see a distinction between those today because it is important for us to know that there are some things that are uh, out of bounds for us, some things that we can't come to a middle ground in deleting some principle on this side, deleting some principle on that side, and come to a common understanding. There are some areas in which you can compromise. One, being facetious, <clears throat> we'll say, for instance, suppose someone wants us to repaint our auditorium. Some want it to be purple. Some want it to be blue. Someone said, no, brown's better. So we'll compromise and we'll come together and we'll say, well, we'll paint it 
purple polka dot. We can compromise on that because it's not a spiritual matter. It's not a scriptural matter. Jesus did not say, Thou shalt worship in an auditorium with purple walls. So we can compromise in that area. We can compromise, for instance, on the number of songs that Tom puts on the board and leads, whereas the number that is here, we could make that to be three, we could make it to be five, we could make it to be fourteen. That's not a designated matter in Scripture as to how many there will be. So whatever it is that most people want, we can compromise in that. We can compromise in the church, for instance, uh, pertaining to a preacher. As to whether we have a full-time evangelist who works for us, or whether we practice mutual edification as we're currently doing because we don't have a located preacher. That's not a matter that has to be uh, determined one way or the other. It can go either way. It's not something that the Scripture states as a positive. Paul, in writing the church at Corinth, said there were things that were not feasible, but they were lawful. He said there are things that are lawful for me, but those things are not expedient. So he would compromise. Let's look at one instance in which Paul compromised, as found in Acts chapter 16. First three verses of this chapter, the statement is, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Here was Timothy, a young man that Paul wanted to go with him. So the scriptures have told us that Paul uh, took Timothy and circumcised him because his mother was a Jew, his father was a Gentile, and uh, circumcision was that which came into existence back when God first gave the command to Abraham. But it was a part of the Jewish system. And... uh, So here was this young man whose mother was a Jew. So Paul took him and circumcised him, although everyone knew that his father was a Greek. He did that because that was something that could be done without a violation of Scripture. As Paul wrote in Galatians 6, chapter verse 5, In Christ Jesus, circumcision doesn't avail anything or uncircumcision, but faith that works through love. So circumcision was not important. It was important in the minds of some of those people. And because of that, Paul said, I'll compromise. Reading further <clears throat> in the Galatian letter, in the, in the second chapter, uh, further concerning uh, circumcision, notice the statement made there in the second chapter, verse 3, Neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Paul, he could go either way on that. Just as he wrote the church at Corinth, that there are things that are lawful, but they're not expedient. It was an expediency that caused him to uh, have Timothy circumcised because it was expedient. It was a lawful expedient. But folks, we cannot engage in expediences that are not lawful. And that's a point that we want to consider primarily for the balance of our time today. There are areas in which cannot compromise. The first of those, of course, is we cannot compromise the gospel of Christ. Paul said in Romans 1.16 that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, the first two or three verses of that chapter, In writing to the church at Corinth, he said unto them, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. 
He wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, and told him to take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So we cannot compromise the gospel of Christ. We can compromise the color of the walls. Paul could compromise on circumcision because it doesn't matter. But the gospel does matter. Paul said, it is the power of God unto salvation. And we cannot compromise at all on it. We cannot compromise on God's plan for saving man. Unfortunately, there are some in our brotherhood who are compromising God's plan for saving man. We cannot do that because God has not given us that prerogative. In Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There are some uh, preachers in our brotherhood who are saying, He that believes is saved. We can't do that. Because Jesus did not do that. We did not compromise God's plan for saving man. They say, If anyone believes that Jesus is the Messiah, he's my brother. Or she's my sister. The Bible teaches that we become children of God by faith in Christ. As many as have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And thus we're in Christ. And Paul said in that, you are children of God. You've been baptized into Christ. That made you to be a child of God. One who's not a child of God then cannot be a brother or a sister in the family of God. So, when they say, and some do, one, be one believes Jesus is the Messiah, he's my brother. One can believe that Jesus is the Messiah and still not have been baptized. Thus, they are not in the family of God, and thus are not a brother or a sister in Christ. We can't compromise that. God has made it so clear concerning the way of salvation. <clears throat> in Acts, the 16th chapter, when the Philippian jailer, <coughs> excuse me, when the Philippian jailer came to Paul and said, "What must I do to be saved?" He preached on them Jesus. Well, in the preaching to Jesus, under this Philippian jailer, he preached that one is to be baptized, because as a result of his preaching, the jailer took them that same hour of the night and was baptized, both he and all his straight way. And then he rejoiced because he had his sins washed away and thus rejoiced in his salvation. But preaching Jesus involves the preaching of baptism. That's the way he learned that he needed to be baptized. And we cannot compromise uh, on that. When Saul, <clears throat> uh, when the Lord appeared unto him, was read in Acts 9, when he was on his way to Damascus, he was told, he asked the Lord, what, what will you help me do? He was told, go in the city, and there it will be told you what you must do. In the 22nd chapter of Acts, Paul was recounting his conversion. And he said, Ananias came unto me and said unto me, and Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins. Acts twenty-two sixteen. It's baptism that washes away sins. We cannot compromise that plan of God for the bringing about uh, of the salvation of mankind. Neither can we compromise the authority of Christ. Someone might say, well, I think, and I have read, and I believe, as it would pertain to things in religion. But the only authority that we have for things in religion come from Jesus. Jesus. And we cannot compromise his authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, All authority or all power hath been given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. And so we must accept that authority. At the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, in the last verse of Matthew chapter 7, the number of the verse fails me at the moment, but there the statement is that the people that heard Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount 
were astonished at his teaching because he spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus had authority, and we cannot compromise that authority in uh, believing, well, one says this and one says that, so I'm going to come together in the middle. We must accept the authority of Jesus. We cannot compromise it. We cannot compromise scriptural worship. The scripture teaches us how to worship, and uh, we cannot compromise that worship. In John, the fourth chapter, when Jesus was talking to the woman of Samaria at the well, she was talking about that her fathers worshipped in this mountain, others worshipped at Jerusalem. And we want to notice what Jesus said to her concerning the place and how we are to worship. Let's read verses 21 through 24 of John, chapter 4. <clears throat> Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. This is what she had told Jesus. But he said, the hour is coming when that doesn't matter. Ye worship, ye know not what. We worship, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's John 4, verses 21 through 24. We must worship God according to the truth of Scripture. We must also worship in spirit. We must worship from our heart. We must not worship mechanically, but rather we must have our spirits and our minds and our hearts involved in our worship. But it must be according to truth. We cannot compromise that. Now, in the scriptures, we're taught by example. <clears throat> we're taught by the words of the apostles. And in the scriptures, and considering the examples of the early church, when they came together to worship, they sang in their worship services, they sang a cappella which means according to the manner of the church, but at that time it was without mechanical instrumentation. That's our example. We must worship God in spirit and in truth, and the truth tells us that we are to sing as we worship, not play a banjo or a trumpet or a drum, but sing. That's the only thing that the scriptures tell us to do in our worship. We cannot compromise that. Other things that we could consider concerning compromise and worship, but we cannot do it. We must worship according to the instruction in Scripture. We'll mention one other. In the partaking of the Lord's Supper, the Scriptures teach us that the early church partook of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. In Acts the 20th chapter, verse 7, The statement is, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul there was instructing them concerning the contribution. We said on the first day of every week, that instruction be in, because that's the time they came together. Let every one of you lay by him in store, as he's been prospered. That's God's instruction. On the first day of the week, the church comes together. In the 10th and 11th chapters of 1 Corinthians, he is writing that concerning the time when the church comes together. We come together on the first day of the week. We're to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And when he was at Troas on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. That's the time the scriptures tell us to partake of the Lord's Supper. Not once a month or once a quarter. Or annually, as some people do, and think that's all right. Jesus said, as often as you do that, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. So we're to partake of the Lord's Supper. Often, on the first day of the week, we cannot compromise that scriptural worship. We cannot compromise the necessity of baptism. 
We've talked about that enough already, I would say, in Acts 22, 16, which tells us that baptism is for the purpose of washing away sins. One other point that I want to note that we cannot compromise, and that is the purity of life that God demands of his people. We have this given to us uh, in many instances, of course, but in Titus, the third chapter, <coughs> there, beginning in verse 11, rather the second chapter, uh, Paul said, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. And that which the grace of God teaches us, that Paul says has appeared to all men, is something that we uh, need to follow. It teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness. It teaches us that we're to deny worldly lust. It teaches us that we're to live godly, righteously, every day. And we cannot compromise that either. Just as we cannot compromise God's plan of salvation, just as we cannot compromise when we are to particular the Lord's Supper, just as we cannot compromise the things that we do in worship and how we do them, we must not compromise the righteous living that God demands and the purity that he demands on the part of his people. There he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This living soberly means don't get does not mean don't get drunk, although that's part of it. It means we're to be serious in our thinking. We're not to be frivolous in our worship. But we're to think soberly, consciously, seriously about religion. And if we just let it come easy come, easy go, we're not really being sober about our religion. Paul said that we must live soberly, righteously. And as we noted here in the auditorium this morning concerning Zacharias and Elizabeth, in Luke 1, verse 6, the statement is that they were righteous before God because they lived according to God's commandments. That's how Paul said that we are to live. We can't compromise that either. It's just as important that every one of us who are in the church be just as diligent and just as serious in living according to the righteous lives that God would have us live as it is for us to come here on Sunday morning that we might worship. It's just as important on Tuesday and Saturday and Thursday that we live righteously, godly, Soberly. And we cannot compromise that. He went on to say, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. This, his pe- purifying unto himself a peculiar people, Paul does not mean that we're to be peculiar in our dress or in our speech or anything of that nature, except, as it means, in our being different, in our speaking truth, in our speaking righteousness, in our speaking that which is pure, in that we are to be a different people. So a peculiar people, a zealous people, or a purchased people, people who've been purchased by the blood of Christ. That's the type of people we are to be, and that's how we are to live. He said in verse 15, These things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority. So, Paul has said here to Titus, God's people must live soberly, righteously, godly, in this present world. Well, the present world is the only world in which we live. And as long as we're in this world, we must live lives that look like 
that which God would have us to live. Lives that appear in the same manner, same form, as God would have us appear. In that way we're living righteously, godly, soberly, in this present world. And he said in that looking for that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. We need to live in such a way as to be looking forward to the time of the coming of the Lord. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, We know that if this earth the house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He said, In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Paul knew he had to die in order to achieve that. But he looked forward for it. He said, we groan, we earnestly desire, knowing that he must give up this life in order to enjoy the better life. Every one of us should be of that attitude that we look forward to the time when we face the Lord in judgment and hear him say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, <clears throat> inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what I want to hear. You know what you want to hear? You can do it if you do the things we've talked about this morning. If you need to be baptized into Christ, do it today. If you need to be restored to a proper place with God, do it today. All things are ready. Are you? Won't you come? Let's stand and sing.